You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. And hello, world. And welcome to episode 97 of the Common Descent Podcast. Today, we are discussing Venom and Poison. Cool. Which, as we will see as we get into the discussion, is a bad name for this episode. Yeah, the terms <laughs> regarding these things We're are... We're going to start with terminology. Yeah, they're kind of kooky. But Venom and Poison are A, people will know what that means, mm-hmm. so... You've been hooked. You're already listening. We gotcha. And B, as I'll mention in a second, that's what was requested. Yes. So in this episode, we are going to talk about the enormous topic of poisonous and venomous substances created by life. Mm -hmm. What they are, what they do, where you find them, their history, what we know about their evolution. We'll talk about some examples and purported examples from the fossil record. Gonna be a lot of fun. The episode, as I said, was requested. Some requests for venom, some requests for venom and or poison, some requests for venom and poison evolution. Burr, wrapping them all up. Requests by our patron Patrick, Jonathan, Alexander, and Swamp. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you for your request. It should be a whole lot of fun. Hey, before we get into the actual meat of the episode... A few announcements, starting, as always, with our patrons. Patrons! We have a Patreon. If you join us on Patreon, you help support the podcast in its entirety. Everything we do is funded through Patreon. And at a certain level, we'll say your name in gratitude here on the podcast. This episode, we are welcoming Dylan, Jordan, Jerry, and Ash. Welcome, and thank you so much for your support. It's really amazing. Big thanks. We appreciate being able to do this stuff. And speaking of stuff we do... It's October now. It is. Which means we've got a special thing coming up. Will, every year for the past two years, we have done a special event in October called Spooky. Spookulative Evolution. Where we take monsters from the realm of monsters (laughs) and discuss speculative ideas about how we might evolve them in the natural world. Absolutely. Our first year, our topic was... We did classic movie monsters. And our second year... We did Greek mythical monsters. Now this year, starting the second Saturday of October and continuing for the four weeks till the end of the month... Monsters of the Sea, otherwise known as Sea Monsters. We will be discussing some of the most famous historical, mythological uh, examples of sea monsters. Yes. And see how we could evolve them. (laughs) Should be fun. Keep an eye out for those four weeks through October, as usual, to get you in the, the spooky Halloween spirit. I'm so excited. One more thing that's coming up after that, as we've mentioned a couple of times, episode 100 of the podcast. Yeah, it's three episodes around the corner. <laughs> it's it's so close. We uh, were asking people for suggestions. We got tons of ideas for what to do with episode 100. We put a bunch of thought into it, and we have officially decided yes. what the topic for episode 100 is going to be. Uh, it's going to be a topic like a uh, standard episode. Yeah, it will be an, a normal numbered episode just in three digits. But we've chosen a topic that we think is suitably grand, (laughs) suitably uh, significant for episode 100, and we've got some ideas about what we might do to augment episode 100. So there might be some extra special stuff that comes out around that time. Absolutely. And with that, I think our announcements are done. Sounds good to me. Which means we move on to phase two, the news. News! Every episode, we pull some examples of new research, news, things that have been in the news cycle from paleontology, evolutionary study, and the like. Keeps us up to date, keeps you up to date. Will, what news do you got? Well, there's some Spinosaurus news. Isn't there always? So I feel like we would be rioted against if we didn't mention it. <laughs> it's our, our requisite dinosaur uh, yeah. check-in. Well, and, it, and it's like the Elvis of dinosaurs, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not not the Elvis of dinosaurs. <laughs> Though he called the Parasaurolophus Elvis in Lost World, which is what I always think of. That's true. I think of Cryolophosaurus. Ah, uh, yeah. Who has been called the Elvis. Yep. Of... Anyway, yep, yep. Spinosaurus is the big predator with the big sail. Who's not quite the Elvis of Ep- dinosaurs. Episode 42. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bit of new research that adds support to Spinosaurus being an aquatic predator. Now, for 
years, we have slowly been watching our interpretation of Spinosaurus shift from a normal predatory dinosaur to a more and more aquatic or water uh, associated predator. Right. And moving from T-Rex to something more like a heron or a stork or, or a wading bird or yes. something like that. Yeah. And this seems to support that even further so far as saying that it wasn't just a shoreline predator, but a in the water predator, an animal that spent most of its time actually in the water. Intriguing. This is research by Thomas Beaver et al. in Cretaceous Research and the press release is from Sci News. This is st a study looking at remains from the Kim Kim River system in Morocco, a Cretaceous period fossil site. Very fossil, very famous fossil deposit. Yes, a lots of abundance in fossils from that time, and some of these very abundant fossils are teeth, lots and lots and lots of teeth, and many now have been attributed to Spinosaurus aegypticus. Okay, the the famous classic Spinosaurus exactly. species. Exactly. And we've found Spinosaurus teeth before associated with Spinosaurus specimens, and they have long been pointed at as very fish-eating teeth, you know, sharp, conical, you know, round, not slicing teeth, right, like right. we see in uh, your monitor lizards and even to a degree in T-Rex. Right, these are more shaped like croc or like dolphin teeth. Like dolphin-ish teeth. The surface of Spinosaurus' teeth have a distinct enough surface that these isolated teeth have been able to be confidently placed with Spinosaurus or uh, associated okay. to this predator. They have very smooth surfaces, so much so that they actually glint when held up to the light is the way it was described. Oh, interesting. So notable enough, and they sorted through about 1,200 teeth. Whew. For this study and identified that 45% of them were Spinosaurus. Oh, interesting. So a huge number of this assorted teeth. In this river system. In this river system, which is basically record-breaking as far as finding dinosaur teeth in a, 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 a bone-bearing rock formation goes. Yeah, I think we mentioned that in episode 42, that Spinosaur teeth are really common in mm -hmm. some places. And they were pointing at that commonality as evidence that this seems to be too common, too abundant for these teeth loose, so they're likely being shed, which we know predatory dinosaurs did. They shed and replaced teeth. If they're being shed in this dense of a number, it's not likely that Spinosaurus was just visiting the water. Right. But actually living in the water. Right. This is where they're losing most of their teeth. Exactly. Like they're shedding teeth regularly in the river. And so if they were just visiting it to hunt, to drink... You know, even if that was where most of their food was coming from, they shouldn't be leaving so many teeth unless that's also where they're spending most of their, you know, quote unquote downtime. Right. At, at the very least, they're spending enough time here to load the river with teeth. Exactly. And this is supported by, you know, like I said, for the years we've been watching Spinosaurus become more aquatic, one of the most recent ones was the tail looking like it could have been propulsive. Yep. Well, wait for them to swim. And this is another bit of support. So it's just another weight on that side of the scale that, no, Spinosaurus wasn't just a river hunting dinosaur. It seems it was a river dinosaur, which they also point out is just, it may be taking us longer to, uh, the researchers suggest, longer to accept that point of view just because it goes so against the typical idea of dinosaurs for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, but they they are fairly confident that this is good support for it being a most of its time or at least huge chunk of its time in the water animal. It's really interesting to be able to do environmental association studies with dinosaurs like that, because so often you don't get a lot of specimens of a dinosaur. Yes. Now, like spinosaurs are notoriously uncommon in, in many cases in terms of skeletal material. Yes. So it's convenient to be able to do that with teeth especially with theropods. I haven't read this paper. I wonder if there has been any study into what are there scenarios where animals like that are more likely to lose their teeth? Yeah. Cause there is part of it is cyclical. Yes. Right. On a fairly regular basis, each tooth will pop out on a 
kind of a schedule. It, it's kind of a growth cycle. There is a pattern right. and it is a natural growth that old teeth are slowly but surely ejected as new teeth come into their place. Right. So it's not just that you bit something and your teeth broke off and that's when you lost your teeth. Yeah, it's, regrowing teeth isn't just a healing process. Right. It's still going to take time for that new tooth to come in. So, uh, yeah, I suppose it makes sense that if teeth are coming out fairly regularly, you need to be spending lots of time in one place if that's where you're finding most of those teeth. Yeah, and that's mainly what they were pointing at from what I read was just that, you know, they definitely could have been losing teeth just while hunting at the river, but the numbers are just too high for that to make sense. Interesting. According to this team. Well, that's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Boy, we're going to be arguing about Spinosaurus forever. I look forward to it. Hey, speaking of dinosaurs and wet stuff (laughs) this first bit of news from me is research about a time period called the carnian pluvial episode which is the late triassic a period of increased humidity and rainfall that new research suggests might have been an overlooked mass extinction Huh. let's dive in this is research in the journal science advances by jacopo dal corso et al and as a reminder Every episode has a blog post on our blog, and we'll put these links to these uh, articles. The article we'll link to this time is an article in CNN by Katie Hunt. Between about 234 and 232 million years ago, during the Carnian of the late Triassic, was a time of notable environmental change. High humidity, evidence of lots of rainfall, and associated changes to local environments which some have associated in the past. Right? We've known about this for a while, and people have said, oh, this environmental change, uh, uh, it looks like there may have been some ecosystem shifts during this time. At one point, this episode, this period, was thought to just be something that happened in Europe. But in recent decades, evidence has been popping up of a similar thing basically all over the world, that there was this period of climatic shift globally. Hmm. And for a long time, people have said, oh, yeah, I wonder what kind of effects that had on uh, ecosystems. But it's difficult to line up dates very precisely. And this paper actually points out that a lot of models looking at time periods might overlook things that happen in the middle of a time period more so than at the ends. Yeah. As we discussed in episode 15, there is a mass extinction period at the end of the Triassic notably at the very end of the Triassic and then a bit before this period, uh, the beginning of the Carnian, I believe. Well, this paper has collated all sorts of fossil data from all different places to basically put together a review. Here's all the evidence that we see about this time period, and they argue that what this is was a mass extinction. Cool. And the reason they suggest that is because they find evidence for lots of turnover which is to say loss of old species, uh, origination of new species, Mm -hmm. on land and water, lots of species disappearing. They estimated that at this time period, about 33% of marine genera disappear. Wow, yeah, that's that's pretty massive. Disappearance at the genus level. They also point out that this seems to be a period associated with diversification and radiation of major groups. So according to their data... This event seems to be uh, line up with the beginning, the rise of scleractinian coral reefs, which are the reefs we have today, uh, uh, modern plankton groups, as well as the diversification in groups like conifers, uh, plants on land, insects, lots of reptiles, early crocs, lizards, turtles, and dinosaurs. Huh. So they're suggesting that you had this event that not only shuffled ecosystems, but actually was a mass extinction that set into place the diversity we see for the rest of the Mesozoic and also today. Wow. In fact, they point that there's a statement in the paper that says that this ended the phase of instability started by the Permian extinction and kicked off modern ecosystems. Wow. Now, it would be remiss to say this and not point out that not everyone agrees with this. Yeah, because uh, uh, it's difficult to be sure about, all right, are all of our dates actually lining up in the same time? 
extinctions are notoriously difficult to nail down exactly when these groups disappeared, exactly when these went extinct, exact did that exactly line up with this event. So some people are cautioning that eh, let's not jump to conclusions. Let's yeah. keep researching. Let's not throw out the old textbooks quite yet. But these authors also point to potential causes that line up uh, in time. So they suggest that uh, the change in corals and planktons seems to indicate that there were major changes in ocean chemistry. Uh, there are, of course, environmental changes in the climate seen on land. And that this event might line up with, and if you've listened to our mass extinction episodes, then you already know what I'm going to say, a large, large igneous, igneous province. province. These are huge regions of volcanic remains left behind by typically long-term major volcanic eruptions. In this case, the Rangelia Large Igneous Province on the west coast of Canada. Cool. And they say that, as we already know, yeah, long-sustained massive volcanic activity can affect the atmosphere, it can affect ocean chemistry, it can affect soils. So there might be the ingredients here to identify a mass extinction, which would put it basically in that sort of cluster of late Triassic extinction events that ultimately ended the period. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said, yet more caution. We It sounds from the paper like there's still a lot of work to be done actually identifying those changes to atmosphere and ocean and carbon cycle and, and, and all those things. But these authors at the at the very least are saying, hey, let's look at this. Yes. There's a lot going on here. And if this stuff all really does line up in time, then yeah, we might be looking at a much bigger event than we thought it was. Well, and, and research like this is always interesting because this is a big claim. Like yeah. this is this is what they're suggesting is not a small little detail of like, oh, actually, this animal may have had a body temperature a little bit higher. <laughs> you know, this no, no. The, the article that we'll link to the one in CNN, yes. but I also saw one that Michael Benton, one of the authors, wrote um, in the conversation. And he starts that article with scientists recognize five great mass extinctions. Our article, it's like, okay, yeah, no, you're, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're making a big claim. Yes, th this <laughs> is a big, you know, it, if this ends up being true, it will very much shift the way we look at that portion of Earth history. And whenever these sort of claims or this sort of research comes out, there's always going to be debate. There's always going to be hesitation because it's new. You know, any new research that's, you know, still got research yet to go to really solidify it deserves to be questioned yep it's best not to jump uh, mm -hmm. ahead of your data but also when it's a big claim like this that phrase extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence which i know some people take issue with because all things should be traded equal in science but when it's something that is going to change this many things and is involved with this many aspects of of a period in history yeah you need to have some really solid support for, I mean, this, that happened with all the other mass extinctions before people were like, okay, oh, yeah. yeah, asteroid. So hopefully we'll see some more research into all of these different effects and see if they do in fact line up. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty exciting either way because that's, that's some cool data. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, my next bit of news is a little bit less rewriting a huge chunk of our hist Earth history and is about ancient bird beaks, one beak in particular, and what it may tell us about how that beak was functioning compared to today's beaks. So oh, cool. This is research by Case Vincent Miller et al. in Communications Biology, and the press release is from the University of Hong Kong and Science Daily. This is research on a Cretaceous bird called Confucius Ornus. Well, famous Cretaceous bird. Yes, well known, very crow-like, about 120 million years old, and is one of the first birds to be known to have had a beak. So it's one of the earliest beaked birds. Now, beak evolution is not as fully understood as we'd all like. There's still research to be done there. This research took a step farther and analyzed a specimen of Confucius Ornus with laser-stimulated fluorescence, which is the research we've talked about before that 
fires a laser at a fossil and can make certain materials glow and basically reveal things that to the naked human eye would have been the same color as the rock or invisible. Right. Because as we've discussed, we're living in the future. Because we are living in the future. We are living in a video game. We're scanning <laughs> and reveal the secret message. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, uh, Predator. It's detective mode. Detective mode, mode yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it can reveal chemical traces of ideally soft tissues. That's really what this is a cool technique for is in a fossil embedded in rock, sometimes you can find the outlines of the soft tissues or chemicals surrounding the body other than just the bones that we can see. Right. Very well known in bird research because it can help you examine feathers and yes. sometimes coloration and stuff like that. Here, it was used on the beak and was able to identify the quote-unquote soft beak of Confucius Ornus called the Ramphotheca. Yeah, that's the sheath. Yeah, the little cuticle-like sheath. over. It's, it's basically like a fingernail-like covering on the bone of the beak. Right. It, it's very much like a horn. Mm-hmm. And if you if you take a bison's horn off, there is a bone core and then there is a keratin sheath that basically extends and sits over the horn. If anyone's ever had to care for birds, uh, many birds in human care have to have that trimmed because it grows as they use it. And this is why we give lots of birds things to like chew on and stuff because mm-hmm. it keeps the the that uh, a keratin in shape. Not unlike how cats will shed the outer layer of their claws. Yeah. 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 So with this technique, they were actually able to identify that covering. And it seems to have detached from the beak. You know, wearing uh, decomposition and such. Yeah. Mm. It is not on the fossil beak. It is slightly off of and is the first to have been to be reported in a fossil bird. Oh, cool. So this is the first time that they've been able to identify it this way yeah we've uh, we've inferred that they were there yes but they don't preserve no because it's like fingernails so they were able to reconstruct what the beak would have looked like in life and then they compared this to birds of today to get an idea for jaw strength for confucius ornus neat they were able to get not like a measurement not a numbered strength but an idea based on the features of the beak and this covering and because the Ramphotheca had come loose, it doesn't seem like it was strongly attached to the beak like many birds today, mm-hmm. where it is very strongly associated, which suggests to them a not particularly strong beak, a not particularly strong bite, at least, and could suggest that it was eating or better for eating softer foods. And so we don't have like hard numbers, but it seems Confucius Ornus was not taking down tough foods like nuts but maybe softer fruits, maybe insects. I don't right, know how. Right. I don't know where insects fall in the <laughs> soft bugs. Yeah, soft bugs. Yeah, worms. This was a very early bird, and so this is also interesting because though Confucius Ornus, uh, I missed it because I was reading. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's right. They heard it. <laughs> so though Confucius Ornus looked a lot like today's birds, because it. It is very recognizably a bird. Its beak was not constructed in the same way as our birds today. So they're hoping that looking at these sort of features in more fossil birds may give us more insight into how they were actually functioning as birds. Instead of just assuming it looks like a bird must be acting like the birds we have today. Yeah. Very cool stuff. Mm-hmm. I I know that there is a... T- yeah, the, the beak... Fossil beak work is really interesting for the reasons that you're pointing out that it tells us about the functions the behaviors of these ancient birds but also there's tons of questions about beak evolution and when different features of the beak arose and and what steps it took to get to the beak that we have today and because beaks in birds and i believe we talked about this a bit in episode 37 beaks are really unique and really specialized. Yes. I've seen researchers who refer to them as basically a hand on the face. Yeah. Like very fine manipulators. And so I'm excited also to see how this fits into our understanding of when different beak attributes mm-hmm. showed up in bird evolution. Absolutely. And they've also pointed out that with if we do continue to have the ability 
to identify details like this of fossil beaks, it would also be helpful and interesting to start studying modern beaks more closely. For instance, to go through and take a survey of modern birds and see how strong the connection for that covering in the beak, how much that correlates with jaw or bite strength or toughness of food. Yeah. Could really start opening up our understanding of ancient birds. Cool stuff. Yeah. Stuff to look forward to. Yeah. Well, our news has been very Mesozoic focused so far this episode. Yeah. So I'm going to bring it much, much later, almost as later as you can go, and talk about Neanderthals. All right. This is new research that shows... So uh, people may be out there, you may have heard that you might have some Neanderthal DNA in you, because we know that over the last tens, hundreds of thousands of years... Our ancestors, modern human ancestors, interbred with both Neanderthals and the mysterious Denisovans, Mm -hmm. two other major lineages of archaic hominin, uh, sometimes called archaic humans, which I like because, boy, how cool. Right. Multiple groups of humans. All this interbreeding has left impacts on our DNA. We have common throughout humans, some, some more common than others, genes from Neanderthals, genes from Denisovans, some that are adaptive, like there are uh, the high altitude people of Tibet, uh, I believe, have certain genes that help with high altitude adaptation that have been traced to Denisovans. It's like all sorts of cool stuff. This is a bit of research that is focused instead on how Neanderthals were affected by interbreeding with us. Yeah, because it makes sense that if it was happening to one group, it should be happening to the other. So they took DNA from a number of Neanderthal and Denisovan specimens, but they were specifically looking for a particular type of specimen. You see, as it turns out, most of the DNA we have for these archaic humans, it comes from females. Mm-hmm. We, which means we're missing some of the picture. So this study was interested in seeing what can we learn by looking at uh, effectively the paternal lineage via Y chromosomes. Mm -hmm. So they used a technique that specifically identifies and amplifies Y chromosome gene sequences. I love that we can do that with DNA. Yeah. You say, all right, look for these sequences that you see in Y chromosomes, amplify. Yep. Copy it, isolate it, copy it, make a bunch. And they were able to sequence DNA from three Neanderthals in Spain, Belgium, and Western Russia, uh, which all dated to about 40 to 50,000 years old and two Denisovans from Denisova Cave in Siberia uh, that were 50 to 150 or so thousand. And then compare them. Compare their Y chromosomes with each other and with our own ancestors and ourselves. Now here's the thing. Most chromosomes in the, if you look at the autosomal DNA, which is all the other chromosomes that aren't sex chromosomes, they paint a very clear picture that Neanderthals and Denisovans are close relatives and humans are the next ones out. Like, we are the cousins to these two sister lineages. Yes. But when they compared the Y chromosomes, the Neanderthal Y chromosomes looked a lot more like ours. Ah. Which the authors purport seems to indicate that at some point over the evolution of these different lineages, interbreeding with our ancestors led to a replacement of the Y chromosome in Neanderthals. Whoa! Now, that seems like a, a a real big, huge, surprising deal. And it is, but not as much as you'd think. <laughs> because the same pattern is seen in mitochondrial DNA. Oh. So mitochondrial DNA is the DNA that's not in the nucleus of our cells, but in our mitochondria. Mm-hmm. Which have their own DNA, because... <laughs> <laughs> mitochondrial DNA, notably, are passed exclusively through maternal lineages. And they've seen the same thing, that later Neanderthals, mitochondrial DNA is much more like humans, even though at least one specimen of early Neanderthal has mitochondrial DNA much more like Denisovans, huh. which suggests that over time, these two chunks of the genome, the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome DNA, were replaced in Neanderthals with Genes they were getting from us. That's so fascinating. Which is super cool. Now, I have to be clear about this. Not us, us. No. 
the Y chromosomes, they, they specify this in the paper, the Y chromosomes they're seeing in these Neanderthals are not seen in modern humans. Like, no one today has these same sorts of chromosomes. Instead, it looks like these Neanderthals in, inherited those genes from an ancestor of modern humans. So oh. not white modern humans, not quite uh, what you might call homo sapiens, but probably starting a few hundred thousand years ago in ancestors to what we would consider modern humans. Now, this, of course, raises the question of why? What, what favored that? Mm-hmm. Now, that's very difficult to answer, and the authors say, we don't know. But they suggest that one possible explanation is that there may have been a selective advantage for Neanderthal genes to be replaced in the Y chromosome. For example, uh, we know that Neanderthals had generally smaller populations than early human, uh, modern humans, and small populations can lead to buildup of harmful mutations. Mm -hmm. So it could be that they just had a weaker set of genes there, and that when humans started, when we were interbreeding with them, modern humans, they were like, oh yeah, well, those are advantageous. Mm -hmm. It could also be that there was some sex-specific advantages, right? Especially since we're seeing this in Y chromosomes and mitochondrial DNA, it might be that there was something related to reproduction or fertility that was favoring uh, our ancestors' genes over the Neanderthals. The researchers are careful to say, we don't know for sure, but they did run a simulation that showed that even a small percentage of difference in fitness of a benefit could lead to an ultimate replacement mm -hmm. of these chunks of DNA. That wouldn't actually take much of a benefit to make it worth switching out. Right. And the other cool thing about this is that it is a it leads to predictable hypotheses. The next thing they want to do is look at early Neanderthals. Yes. Because in theory, we should be, if this is true, in hypothesis, I guess, we should see that early Neanderthals have more Denisovan-like Y chromosomes. And we might even be able to look at what exactly changed. Yes. And maybe get a get a sense of why. Yeah. Now that we know if if we are correct, if they are correct that this is something they acquired, then we should be able to find the point before they acquired it. Yes. And then maybe figure out what in the world caused Neanderthals to basically swap out mm -hmm. entire sections of their genome. Yes. What was so bad about your old Y chromosome? What was so good about us? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so obviously, it's that. Very interesting. So it's uh, there's we're constantly learning all sorts of ridiculously awesome stuff about these complex genealogies of us and our other ancient ancestors, uh, relatives and such. Yeah, good stuff. And on that note, let us bring the news to an end and move on to our feature presentation discussing venom and poison. And like I said, after the break, we're going to talk about what those terms are actually mean and i'm going to give you a new term to yes. think about stay tuned will you worked in an aquarium i sure did i bet you had to field the question rather often of the difference between what we mean when we talk about poisonous and venomous absolutely we're going to do a bunch of term talk here for a, a little bit, but let's start with that. G go ahead. What's the difference between venomous and poisonous? So the typical difference that's given or definitions that are given is that poison is almost always defensive and it's something that you have to bite or touch that animal to be poisoned by it. While venom can be defensive, but it can also be uh, attacking, a predatory and they have to bite, attack, inject the poison into you. Right. And so it's how it's administered that makes them different. It's right. why you can drink rattlesnake venom, <laughs> but you shouldn't lick frogs. Right. Poison is passive on the poisoner's part. Mm -hmm. Venom is active. Yes. Those are your sort of standard how we differentiate poisonous versus venomous uh, 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 creatures. And... It's important to note, they're not mutually exclusive. Nope. You can be both. There are frogs that are poisonous and 
kind of venomous. Mm -hmm. There are snakes, keelback snakes, that are venomous and poisonous. I'm sure there are bugs. There's got to be insects. Oh that, yeah, that are poisonous and venomous. I just don't know any. Yeah, I'm I'm sure there's got to be a wasp that if you were to eat it, <laughs> it would make you feel bad. But it is very important to remember, and we're gonna move away from these terms because these terms are extremely human centric. Yes. When someone calls something poisonous, a poisonous animal, what they typically mean is harmful to humans. Mm-hmm. If a human licks that frog something bad will happen. Yes. There are lots of organisms that are poisonous or venomous to a larva. Mm -hmm. You know, some snakes are venomous enough that they're dangerous to bugs, but not to us, so we don't call them venomous. Yes. Well, it's, um, I've heard the term many a time of non-venomous spiders, which there is one group, I don't remember what it's called, but there is one which I don't think naturally produces venom. But... Other than that one very specific subset of spiders, all spiders are venomous. Most either are not venomous enough to hurt us or literally can't bite us Mm -hmm. because their jaws are too itty bitty because they're meant for eating gnats. So what we're going to do is we're going to go a little bit deeper and talk some more clinical definitions. Mm -hmm. And we're going to define poison in the broad sense, venom, and a new term, For us here, toxin. Toxins. So here we go. Poison. According to, you look at dictionary definitions, you look at medical definitions, biological definitions, poisons typically refer to any substance that is harmful if too much is eaten, inhaled, injected, or absorbed through the skin. Usually these are chemical impacts that they're Mm -hmm. having, right? They're messing with bodily functions by getting in the way of normal processes, by damaging cells, something like that. This definition, this sort of broad definition, includes all sorts of things. Mm. Poisonous gas, lead poisoning, right? You can get radiation poisoning. Basically anything that chemically messes with your body if you get it in your system is a poison. This can also include, because you'll notice in that definition, if too much is eaten, absorbed, etc., Water can be poisonous. Yep. If you get too much of it. Uh, uh, one of the examples I saw while reading uh, uh, about poison dif- uh, examples, table salt is poisonous to slugs. Absolutely. Right? Like, t- poison is very, very broad. Well, it's like uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Yep. You encounter com- carbon monoxide all the time, but as long as you're not trapped in a room that's mostly carbon monoxide... <laughs> then or carbon f- dioxide. Yeah. Then you're mm-hmm. fine. Toxins more specifically in the biological sort of medical sense, typically refers to poisons produced by organisms. Mm -hmm. So these are substances, uh, proteins, any sort of compound or item or substance that is made by organisms. Through metabolism. Plants, bacteria, animals. Otherwise, this is a subset of poisons. I also noted that toxin gets used for a lot of other stuff. And my favorite while I was looking for definitions is I saw on Wikipedia that it has a little section in the page that describes the use of the word toxin in, and I'm quoting, quackery and alternative medicine. (laughs) Uh, That's all I'm calling it from now on. (laughs) In which toxin means uh, bad stuff. Yes, things we don't like. (laughs) But biologically speaking, toxins are poisons produced by organisms. Venom is a subset of toxins, or oftentimes collections of toxins, that, much like our earlier definition, are injected. Are administered actively. Through bites, through stings, anything like that. Toxin often will refer to a single substance, so a single protein that might be a toxin or something like that. Venom typically refers to combinations of things multiple toxins, sometimes other stuff. We'll, we'll talk in, here in a little bit about that. But basically, like the common definition, venom is I've got some toxins and I put them in you on purpose. As you might imagine, based on these terms, this is a real broad subject. Yes. So in this episode, we are going to talk in the broadest strokes about what we know of diversity of poisons and venoms, uh, of toxins specifically in living organisms, and then some evolution, let's start with 
the diversity of toxins. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> a, toxins means a thing that an organism produces that is toxic. Oftentimes, toxins come in lots of different categories, the, uh, naming categorical systems. Oftentimes, toxins will be categorized by what their effect is. So you'll hear terms like neurotoxin, mm -hmm. which is a toxin that impairs nervous system, like nerve activity. Myotoxins interfere with muscle activity or damage muscles. Necrotoxins Ugh. deal 2d6 ongoing necrotic damage. Yeah, right? Uh, they call it cell death is yes. what necrotoxins yeah, are. Yeah, it's literally just killing your tissues. Yep. Just, just it's That's the one that creeps me out the most. You just start rotting. Yeah, it just starts eating you away. <laughs> Uh, you'll hear terms like cardiotoxins for heart uh, uh, things. Cytotoxins are sometimes used for toxins that affect individual cells. Uh, like a specific kind of cell. Mm -hmm. oh. Other times, toxins might be named for who they come from. Right? You'll hear terms like cyanotoxins, which right, right, are right. toxins produced by cyanobacteria. Uh, bufotoxins hey. from toads. Uh, dendrotoxins, yeah. which are named for the genus dendroaspis. Do you know what dendroaspis is? Consider who's saying it. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> dendroaspis are mambas. Yes. I, Black and green I mambas was and stuck such. on the dendro. I was <laughs> skipping the aspis. Yep. <laughs> the part that means snake. Yeah, and then I was like, oh, right. Asps. <laughs> yeah. Listen, there's a reason I'm the one doing the Venom episode. <laughs> I skipped over it many a time on the list. <laughs> <laughs> Other times you'll hear terms that refer to how they're produced. So in bacteria, toxins are often differentiated between exotoxins, which you get as the bacteria secretes them, like excretes outside the cell, and endotoxins, which are released when the bacterial cell blows up. Many toxins are very specific to what kind of life they affect. Mm -hmm. Right, Some toxins are harmful to fungi. Some toxins are harmful to certain groups of animals and others. Well, this is how a lot of your pesticides and your yes. you know, herbicides are, are functioning nowadays is this is poisonous to mosquitoes. Unless we accidentally find another insect that has almost an exact same metabolism as a mosquito, everything else is fine. Right. Which is kind of crazy. And that's a topic that we will, that this is going to come up repeatedly here. One of the reasons that toxin is such a broad term is that the toxicity of, an, of a substance depends on who you ask. Exactly. <laughs> right. Certain toxins. So uh, I have an example a bit further down, but uh, bo botulinum toxin, which is the bacterial toxin that causes botulism, is considered one of the most dangerous toxins in the world for humans. Mm -hmm. But there are animals like vultures yes. that don't have a problem with it. Right? What counts as toxic is different. And there's all sorts of weird, cool ways for measuring toxicity. Uh, uh, th there's the famous LD50 measurement, which basically is what is the dose of this substance that is lethal to 50% of whatever organism mm -hmm. in whatever period of time. Uh, I also came across a measurement called a mouse unit. <laughs> yes. Which is, how much of this does it take to kill a mouse? <laughs> I was going to ask if they had an elephant one for all those documentaries. Of, oh, you only right. need this much to kill a full-grown African elephant. <laughs> Elephants are harder to breed in lab situations. <laughs> Toxins are diverse in the kind of effects they have. So... There are toxins, like I said, that affect nervous system, that affect muscle tissue. There are toxins that can impact uh, blood coagulation. There are toxins that are just to taste bad or mm -hmm. to cause pain. Yeah, there's plenty that are really not dangerous, just unpleasant. Some uh, mess with digestion. Some mess with your brain activity, Ugh. like the famous fro hallucinogenic frogs and mushrooms. Yeah, bufo toxins. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are some that are lethal. Deadly. Yeah, Some the point is to kill. In just by their very, like one toxin in some cases, single toxin substances can be extremely deadly. Others, like you said, yeah, it hurts or it's kind of uncomfortable or something. Well, that's why you hear about so many people, like anyone who lives in Texas, I probably has a story similar to this of their dog getting bitten by a rattlesnake, puffing up a whole bunch and then going back to being a dog right not all toxins are deadly yeah and we'll talk some more point about that too 
Another really cool thing about toxins is there's tons of convergence. Yeah. So there are lots of, to- right? Not all neurotoxins are related to each other. Yeah, we didn't evolve neurotoxins way back in the Cambrian and then diversify from there. Right. Different toxins have shown up in different places that do different things to have the same effect. So different toxins might affect different parts of a nerve cell, but the end result is that it interferes with nerve conductivity. Yeah, we can attack different parts of your nerves and all of those different attacks still paralyze or whatever it is. The actual activity that toxins are doing is often damaging cells, uh, inhibiting cellular activity. Mm -hmm. So uh, ion channels are very important mechanisms in the membranes of cells that are basically controlling the flow of certain ions that keep the cell running. Yeah. A lot of toxins mess with ion channels, yeah, especially neurotoxins. Your cells basically are covered with in and out plugs that yes. they need to <laughs> keep their chemicals right, but also to communicate with one another. And if you just chemically plug those, the cell just can't. Some toxins mess with protein formation or enzyme activity. Others induce activity, like yeah. activate pain receptors or or cause cell death. A lot of these things are the kinds of things that there are already biomolecules in all living bodies that do this stuff. Yes. Moderating cell activity, enzymes, protein formation. Like everyone, every organism's body has enzymes whose job it is to break cellular proteins. Yeah. That's an important part of life. A lot of toxins are kind of taking those processes and then directing them at other organisms who didn't ask for them <laughs> <laughs> or going into a body and turning that up to 11 now mm-hmm. venom like i said typically refers to a compound uh, 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 often you'll hear it called cocktails lots of different substances that work together to have some sort of effect i have a book of uh, venomous reptiles of north america and there's a whole section in the beginning of the book about venom <laughs> and they go through some of the common components of snake venom that's awesome which include lots of toxins right most snake venoms have multiple toxins for various effects neurotoxins uh, and or necrotoxins or myotoxins a lot of them have destructive enzymes that are toxic that can impair cell activity or impair the immune system. There are also secondary substances in a lot of snake venom, like enzymes that damage intracellular membranes. So the membranes mm. are intercellular between cells, which helps the venom spread faster. Yeah, it's, it's breaking down the barriers between the cells, so the venom can right. just... Now, like I said, with toxins, that a lot of toxins, not always... But many toxins are very specific as to what they do. Many venoms are very broad. Yeah. Many venoms are not very picky about who is affected by this venom. They tend to affect lots of different things. That's why a snake bite, a rattlesnake bite, is bad for pretty much any animal that gets bitten by a rattlesnake. Yes. So there's tons of diversity in the actual substances themselves, toxins and venoms. There's also tons of diversity in where we see them yes so now let's take a step back and talk about who are our poisonous and venomous and toxic uh, companions here in the world turns to everyone you're not wrong (laughs) let's start with toxins I, i i'll paraphrase from one of the papers i read basically all living things produce toxins yes like i said toxin is relative Basically, bacteria, fungi, protozoans, plants, animals, basically all have some substances that they produce that are harmful to some other life. Typically, toxins are defensive. A lot of the time, toxins are incorporated into immune systems. We have toxins in our immune systems. Yep. Right? Uh, Our cells of our immune system use toxins against bacteria Uh, Or sometimes uh, we have uh, certain cells in our immune system that will produce toxins to kill our own cells Mm -hmm. when they get infected or when they become tumor cells. This is true in lots of other uh, groups. Lots of plants and fungi have antimicrobial toxins that are either inside the body or on the outside of the body. 
that are toxic to bacteria just to keep them from getting colonized and infected. Yeah, immune systems are murdering microbes all over the place. All of the time. That's specifically what we want them to do. So toxins are often innate immune substances against pathogens. You also get lots of toxins that are competitive. Their, their victims are competitors. A lot of bacteria toxins are harmful to other bacteria. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Basically, that's the way the bacteria make sure it doesn't have to compete with other species of bacteria. Yeah, you can't grow next to me because I've made this little area toxic to you. In fact, some of the toxins that bacteria have that are bad for us are thought to be that. Mm -hmm. Botulinum is one that there. Some think that botulinum might be or might have started as an antibacterial toxin that also happens to be extraordinarily deadly for humans. Yeah, because well, that can also happen where a toxin designed for purpose A happens to also line up with situation B. And then we get all offended about situation B, but that's not what it was about. <laughs> and we will talk a bit about that later as yes. well. Uh, there are plants that do uh, similar competitive toxins. Yeah. So uh, black walnut, for example, produces a toxin called juglone, which inhibits respiration in other plants. It suffocates other plants so that they don't grow nearby. It's just another reminder that plants are terrifying. Plants are... L listen... Send us your plant requests. We got, we got Allie on. I don't have speed dial anymore. Yeah. And then other times, toxins are straight up defensive against predators. Mm -hmm. This is your classic, uh, uh, what you think of with frogs and insects and fish. What where, typically is referred to as poisonous. Yes, exactly. Some of those are there. Uh, some of them cause discomfort because mm -hmm. the idea is just, I tried to eat this bug, it tastes bad, and I spit it out. Yeah, lots or of it hurt, and I spit bitter it out. toxins and stuff like that. But there are deadly toxins uh, that can be fatal. We also see this in a lot of plants and fungi who have toxins that are itchy or bad tasting that are there to discourage predators from eating them. Mm -hmm. The one that comes to mind for me, of course, is poison ivy and poison oak. Although I did see a little note somewhere that some consider those to be allergens, not toxins, which is technically correct because a toxin messes with body function and an allergen, according to that, where I read that causes the, an immune system reaction mm -hmm. that kind of turns the body against itself. Yeah. An allergic reaction is when your own immune system overreacts, right. overcompensates due to some stimulus and ends up basically causing problems for you you know for yourself right you played yourself <laughs> exactly yeah because there are people who i've i i don't know for sure that i am but i've never gotten poison ivy there are people who don't have that reaction oh yeah to poison ivy and poison oak because it is an allergic reaction now the distinction between allergen and toxin is beyond the scope of this episode <laughs> that's the last you'll hear about it uh some poisons that are defensive have really odd and specific functions and causes. One that I came across while researching that I didn't know and I'm blown away by. Clawed frogs, yeah. Xenopus, uh, at least some of them, have certain proteins, certain substances in their skin mucus that induces yawning. <laughs> Supposedly... <laughs> So they can crawl out of snake mouths. Yeah. Yeah. That there is a poison and it induces the snake to yawn and gape its mouth. And then the frog crawls out. The Which thing... in my notes, I have that written. And then in parentheses, it says in all caps, what? <laughs> the thing I love about that so much is in case people out there don't realize, we still argue about exactly why we yawn. <laughs> That's true. Like, we don't fully understand why <laughs> the human yawn exists or what it does. I've heard things like it aerates your brain, that it's right, to get extra it gets oxygen. oxygen. Mm -hmm. uh, the but, argument of why it's contagious is also not understood. But apparently you can <laughs> induce it with a poison. But yet, the frog <laughs> understands it well enough. I know that they don't understand it, but their proteins sure do. <laughs> That's insane. Another cool effect of toxins... Uh, and poisons uh, uh, broadly, as we see in a lot of poisonous animals, is that oftentimes toxins are borrowed. Mm -hmm. There are symbiotic examples. So there are a lot of uh, cases where toxic fungi live on plants. Yes. And they're not toxic to the plant. 
but they're toxic to animals that might eat the plant. And so basically the it's symbiotic. The plant is living with this fungus because the fungus keeps herbivores away. It's a symbiote. But then there are lots of animals that sequester toxins that they pick up from elsewhere. Yes. Uh, lots of animals get uh, toxins from plants that they eat. Uh, insects often do that. I believe the Carolina parakeet uh, was one that yep. that used to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are other birds that are poisonous. They're not producing their own poison, but they have a mechanism in their body to when they eat a poisonous plant, they hold on to it. Yeah, well, they, the, they keep that poison tucked away. The famous monarch butterfly eating the milkweed. Yes, exactly. Other animals get them from other animals. A lot of frogs, uh, poison dart frogs, uh, at least in part, get are thought to get their poison from bugs. Yeah. Ants and centipedes and stuff. That's one of my favorite examples, just because they're the go-to poisonous frog example. Yes. And we had a whole bunch of the aquarium that you could have stuck your hand in and picked them up because we didn't feed them ants. Yeah, because in <laughs> captivity, the same thing is true of the rhabdophus, the killback snakes. Yes, exactly. They're not producing their own poison. The snakes that have those, and they have pouches for poison. Mm-hmm. It's not like it's just floating around. They have a special pouch for it. Where it is concentrated. But if they're not eating the right kinds of frogs, they don't have poison. Uh, there are also cases where animals can accidentally dentally kind of become poisonous <laughs> so the snake example that comes to mind is that there are certain populations of garter snakes that prey on poisonous newts and the snakes are resistant to the poison but if a snake eats a lot of newts in a short period of time the snake now has enough toxin in it that like if a bird ate the snake it would get sick <laughs> i like that that's like the toxic equivalent of that one episode of magic school bus where he eats too many of yes! his, and he turns yeah, orange. Yeah, that's exactly the, uh, the comparison <laughs> yeah. that I thought. Yep. Your, your carotene. <laughs> and then, of course, there are some famously lethal toxins, right? Certain bacteria, like t- t- bacteria that produce botulinum. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are deadly mushrooms. There are algae that, that uh, can cause things like shellfish poisoning. Uh, there's a, a CDC page that is toxins to look out for, Ooh. which is where my list came from. They also list a couple of plants, uh, for example, plants that produce ricin. And then to throw in a, an, an animal example there, puffer fish are a really common example. Yeah, very scary. Deadly poison. So toxin, poisonous things, toxic uh, organisms are extremely broad. The answer is basically everybody. Although they're using them in different ways for different things, sometimes internally, sometimes mm-hmm. externally. Sometimes for competition, sometimes for against predators, sometimes just against microbes and such. Yeah, chemical warfare is kind of the standard play game set, you know, a, a starter set for most of life. I mean, you you already have all the equipment for it. Yeah. You're full of enzymes and nerve inhibitors and all sorts of stuff. Well, and the fact that so many microbes use it, it's very likely one of the, like, first things we were using so yeah it it seems exotic but it's really not much more exotic and rare is venom yeah venom is a little bit easier to talk about in specific terms because it's it is a more specialized version of toxic activity well, it's like the martial arts of toxins where it's like <laughs> we <laughs> they perfected it, it any of us can throw a punch or oh, a yeah. kick you but you gotta know what you're doing <laughs> to actually use martial arts Venoms, as opposed to many toxins to poisons, are typically offensive in nature. Venom, much more often regularly than poison, is for predators. Yeah. Pred- also for defense. There are a lot of venomous animals that are defensive, but a lot of venoms are thought to have been evolved to be primarily to service prey or other resource acquisition. You are going out and you are choosing to put your venom somewhere. Oftentimes this is just to kill prey. Mm -hmm. I bite you, you are dead, I can eat you now. Other times it is for paralytic effects on prey. Sometimes because, okay, you are paralyzed, I can eat you now. But there are some animals that will use paralytic venoms to then, like, store the prey. Like, lay a few eggs on you. And there are some that will, (laughs) yep, there are parasitoid wasps. I have a venom that will paralyze you so I can lay my eggs inside. And then some have teamed up with a virus in their venom to mind control you after your... Yeah, it's horrifying. Venoms are typically produced 
by the venomous animal. Venom is used for animals. Yeah. Because venom has a very active component that doesn't really compute with things like fungi and plants. Like, yeah. plants aren't hunting. Like, I think the stinging nettle is, like, one of the only plants I'm aware of that has an, an ejection system. Mm-hmm. Has the thorns that actually sting you with its its toxins. And because venom is actively delivered, a lot of venom evolution also comes along with delivery systems. Yeah. Venomous creatures tend to have special fu- uh, features for their venom. Snakes have needle fangs, like mm-hmm. hypodermic needle fangs. Scorpions and their stingers, bees and wasps and their stingers. And there is, again, lots of convergence. Lots of different venomous animals have come to use similar compounds for similar effects, or even different compounds for similar effects. Not everything that's neurotoxic in its venom is necessarily related. That that this evolution of these substances happens over and over and over again. Yeah, and you definitely you can see some trends because like fish have a lot of defensive venoms with like yes. spines on the back and on the tail, but you don't see that as commonly in snakes and other groups. So before we we go any further. Let's look at the diversity of venomous animals. Cool. Because it's fun. And because there are some surprises on this list. There are a bunch of venomous mammals. Mm-hmm. Shrews, selenodons, vampire bats are considered uh, often considered venomous. Oh. Because their saliva has compounds for, like, anti-blood yeah. coagulation and stuff like that. That is technically... No. Of, oh. Male platypuses yeah. have venoms in their ankle spines. Slow lorises are weird. We don't have time to talk about them. <laughs> yeah. uh, there are a couple of purportedly venomous amphibians. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. amphibians are typically, you think of as poisonous. Frogs, salamanders have poisonous mucus. Yeah, that my skin is toxic. But there are a couple species of frogs that have spines on their skull that they'll use to stab their poison into something that's bothering them, which makes it venom. Yeah. That, now, it's, now it's venomous. Now I've injected it. Uh, there are salamanders that do the same thing with ribs. That's my favorite. <laughs> like, of all of the weird poisonous, they have ribs that poke through little toxin pouches, venom pouches on their yep. side. And now they just have a row of venomous spines that weren't there a second ago. Yep. (laughs) Which is like Wolverine. Yeah. And then there's reptiles, which I think are probably often the first group that comes to mind when people think of venomous animals. But venom's actually not particularly common in reptiles. No, it's not. Turtles are not venomous. Crocs are not venomous. Tuataras aren't venomous. Most lizards are not venomous, like yeah. geckos, chameleons, you know. You don't actually see a lot of venom in reptiles. There are a couple of famous examples of lizards. Mm-hmm. Komodo dragons are an example. Heloderma. Yeah. The Gila monster and beaded lizards, which are highly venomous. Yes. Uh, very venomous lizards from here in the southwest U.S. But then, snakes. Yes. Snakes are the champions of reptile venom and one of the some of the champions of animal venoms in general yeah tons of different groups vipers uh, are venomous elapids your cobras your coral snakes are venomous there are a lot of snakes that are mildly venomous there like are some and stuff like yeah that. exactly there are some that you have groups like the colubrid snakes which typically aren't considered dangerously venomous until you meet a boom slang yes which has venom that causes you to melt <laughs> like, <laughs> snakes are ex- a, most of research on venoms has been on snakes mm-hmm. largely because a they're easy to find <laughs> but also very significant for humans yes snakes are possibly the most human medically significant venomous animals but there's more Tons of fish are venomous. Lots of venomous fish. I found one paper that's, that, that summarized that there are nearly 3,000 known venomous species of fish, which of note is about the number of all snakes, <laughs> and that venom appears to have originated at least 19 times in fish. Which doesn't surprise me if only for all the weird places you find it on their bodies. You got stingrays, you've got catfish, toadfishes, stargazers, stonefish... Some have spines, some have fangs, 
Some, like stingrays, have mm-hmm. barbs on their tails. Yeah, some it's in a line on their backs. Some it's at the tip of their fins. It's all over the place. But vertebrates are our only one side of the venom equation because there are tons of venomous invertebrates. So many. Arthropods, once again, the famous cases. Bees, wasps, caterpillars, ants. These are all insects mm-hmm. that have come upon venomous solutions. Centipedes tend to be venomous. Scorpions are famously venomous. But among arthropods, much like snakes, among vertebrates are the most famous. No other invertebrate group matches up to spiders. Spiders are terrifying. Even if not in terms of diversity of venom or or whatever, but in terms of how much we care about it, Mm -hmm. spiders are up there with snakes on medically significant venomous animals. And to specify, spiders aren't actually terrifying. They're really, really great and Super awesome. Cool. But their venom, especially for their prey, <laughs> is horrifying. Yeah, they do all <laughs> sorts of good, disturbing things. Other invertebrates, of course, there are toxic cephalopods. Yes! Blue-ringed octopus and being a famous venomous example. Almost all octopus are venomous, just once again, not to us. Right. To their prey. The giant Pacific octopus that can be 10 feet long is venomous. It has a venomous <laughs> bite. And then there are gastropods, like very famously cone snails, oh, yeah. which are so have some of the most, the strongest venom in the animal kingdom. Yeah, ridiculously fast acting. You've got sea urchins, you've got anemones, mm-hmm. with, that's the stinging stuff that, fi- that Nemo and his dad swim through. Yeah. They're... And it goes, bzz, 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 <laughs> even though it's venomous. Yeah, I used to have to explain to people, because they'd be like, don't they shock you? I'd go, no. they go, why do I think they shock me? Because <laughs> of Finding Nemo. And I'd go, because everything that's ever shown, <laughs> jellyfish or anemones shocking you, makes that sound, because what noise does a sting make? Yeah. <laughs> and then, as you just mentioned, yeah, jellyfish. Yeah. Are also famous for venom. Now, like I said at the beginning of these discussions, this is a general overview. I know I've left things out. Yes. Venom, the point is, venom has shown up over and over and over again, all across different groups of animals that use it in different ways for different purposes. Basically in every big group. But yeah, most major groups have seen some version of venom show up. So venom, poison, toxins are core to the life on Earth experience all over the place. After the break, let's turn our gaze backwards, starting with the question of... Is there evidence of venom, poison, toxins in the fossil record? Yeah. Stay tuned. The answer is yes. (laughs) There are evidences of venomous, poisonous, toxic organisms in the fossil record. Let's start with venom, because, as we mentioned in the first part, venom often comes associated with physical adaptations. Yes. Which means that venom is, in theory, a lot easier to recognize in fossils, because you just look for the physical signs of venom delivery. Yeah, because typically there should be an applicator. And indeed, most signs of venomous creatures in the fossil record are basically the same as we see today, right? Venomous snakes with fangs for injecting venom are known back millions of years. Mm -hmm. We have wasps and bees in amber with stingers. Yes. We've got uh, barbs and spines on rays and other fish. All over the place. Going back. For stingrays, I've seen it cited as at least the Cretaceous, Mm -hmm. arguably the Paleozoic. Yeah, and we find tons of those because they shed them just like teeth because, wow, okay. Speaking of venom adaptations, and this is a little bit of a sidestep into a whole other topic, but it's a cool example. A 2017 study identified a cockroach in Burmese amber, so Cretaceous amber. There are toxic cockroaches that have uh, compounds that are bad smell or bad tasting or, or repellent. Unpalatable. This particular fossil cockroach had the same sort of pale and dark coloration oh. that we see in modern harlequin cockroaches, which is warning coloration. Oh. So they're inferring that this cockroach was 
probably also had chemical defenses that it was warning against. The only thing that would make that better is if, in fact, it was not toxic, but was mimicking another toxic cockroach. Which Just, it could have been. Uh, that That's the only thing that would make me happier is like, no, we don't have the toxic one, but it was definitely <laughs> mimicking. <laughs> ah, that'd be so cool. All right. So we do have examples of, you know, structures, uh, features of organisms that seem to indicate venom or, in the case of the cockroach, poisons, toxins in the past. There are a couple of famous tetrapod examples. One that many of our dinosaur fans might have already thought of is the dinosaur Synornithosaurus. This is a dromaeosaurid dinosaur, so a relative of Velociraptor, Deinonychus, and friends. There was a 2009 study that claimed to find evidence of venom in Synornithosaurus. Their lines of evidence included A, grooves in the teeth, which we see in things like beaded lizards, which have yeah. grooves where the venom kind of slides yeah, down. Right. It runs along the right. tooth. It's not a tube. It's not like a snake needle fang, but a, a channel for the venom to, to go down. That the dinosaurs had particularly long teeth. Okay. And spaces at the base of the teeth, which the authors say could be for venom glands. Yes. Now, this has been disputed. Uh, a 2010 study and others have pointed out that those probably are in venom glands and that lots of non-venomous animals have grooves in their teeth for different reasons and that the length of the teeth might just be how the skull is preserved. So it is generally not accepted that Synornithosaurus was a venomous dinosaur. Possible, but these don't appear to be convincing evidences of venom. On the other hand, similar evidence has been found in a, an animal named Euchamberzia, which is a therapsid, which means it's one of our cousins, right? Mm -hmm. A proto-mammal group from the Permo-Triassic 250 or so million years ago. A 2017 study looked at the skull and found, again, ridges in the teeth, which some venomous animals have. Could be useful for that. And in the jaw, they found a big space where a gland would have sat and a canal from that space that led to the mouth. Now, that's much more convincing. Now, that looks like a gland with a passage for delivery with tooth grooves to deliver it into the prey. They point out that these could be nerve related, that, mm -hmm, that the gland mm -hmm. could be a nerve cluster and that the canal could be, you know, for, for nerve passage. But those authors, and it seems I've seen it cited elsewhere, think that this looks like a pretty good sign of venomous adaptations in this proto mammal. Yeah, it's, it's one of those where Venom is not the only answer, but it is a very good answer. Yeah, it sure seems to fit, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. That's awesome. And I, I like these examples because we had similar arguments about like the Komodo dragon mm -hmm. for a long time with people being like, is it venomous or does it just have really bad spit? And went back and forth on that. So it makes sense that in the fossil record, similar features are going to be even more argued. Yep. There is one other example that I know of of a tetrapod suggested to be venomous. And this one, in some ways, is the most convincing. This is a reptile from the late Triassic called Uatchitodon, which is tentatively identified as an archosauriform. Cool. So cousin of crocs, dinos, birds, the archosaur group. It's known only from teeth, which is part of why it's hard to identify. Yep. The, there was a 2010 study that compared the teeth of this taxon, this reptile, from three different sites of varying ages across the late Triassic and found that in the oldest teeth, geologically, right, the earliest teeth, the teeth have grooves, like we saw in Euchamberzi and Synornithosaurus. In the latest teeth, the grooves are completely enclosed yes. into tubes like we see in venomous snake fangs. Yes. And their argument here is, why else would you have that? <laughs> it's Not... for injecting air. No, it's just... like a vampire. They're, yeah. they're <laughs> sucking blood. <laughs> if they're right, not only is this the earliest known evidence of venom in a reptile, which is real cool, but also a possible sign of how 
venom injecting fangs evolve. Yes. That you go from an open groove to a closed uh, uh, tube, which has been suspected, but we don't have evidence for it in the fossil record. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> when looking at a hollow snake tooth and asked, okay, but how'd you get that? This That was the logical deduced answer right. and is... there is some evidence from snake tooth development mm-hmm. that kind of points in that direction but without having a fossil that you can watch do it that it's it's just hypothetical that is amazing and i love it how cool oh, how cool goodness i have a new animal if i could bring back any fossil animal yep. <laughs> that's, that's i think that just made it close to the top of the list don't get don't get too close <laughs> <laughs> now those are sort of physical adaptations there are other ways we can infer toxins in the past uh one way predominantly is by comparing with our living groups and estimating how far back their toxins go so for example there is a 2014 study that estimated that among monotremes platypuses and echidnas uh based on uh, comparative studies they concluded that the common ancestor of platypuses and echidnas was probably venomous. Really? Like modern platypuses, and echidnas lost it. Huh. So if we find fossil platypuses, might be a good bet that they are venomous. Yeah. Also, echidnas, what are you doing? They listen, if you don't need it. But yeah. No one messes with an echidna. They got all the other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but knuckles could have been, could have had venomous <laughs> spines. A 2016 study identified a plant in Dominican amber that was identified as an extinct species of a group called Strychnos, which today famously produce strychnine. Ah. The the famous poison of, I think, like Shakespearean (laughs) use or something. It's the dramatic poison. (laughs) And they suggest that, yeah, this ancient one probably had similar poisons. Anything with an immune system is going to have some sorts of toxins. DNA comparison, we can feasibly compare ancient DNA. So there's, there's a lot of ways that we can say, all right, well, this fits into our evolutionary history of venoms and toxins. Yeah. So we can infer, even if we don't have a lot of details. Yeah, that, that with our current evidence, it would make more sense than not for it to have at least some of the toxicity that we're right. seeing in today's. And then there is the one example that... I was able to find of fossilized toxins. This is a 2007 study that found a soldier beetle in Burmese amber. All around its body, it had these vesicles, these sort of chambers in its body that uh, we see in modern similar beetles where they have chemical reservoirs, like they store chemicals in there. The vesicles in this Burmese amber preserved beetle were open which we see in beetles today when they are exuding a response, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've been disturbed, I'm releasing my chemicals. And near one of the vesicles was the antenna of another insect with what appears to be a chemical deposit on it. Whoa. This appears to be amber that captured this beetle releasing poisons, releasing toxins, in response to being bothered by another insect. Whoa. How cool is that? We need the people from Jurassic Park to take their little drill. (laughs) (laughs) To get those toxins out. Yeah. Interesting. And it makes sense to me that that would be the one that preserved, the one that literally sprays. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, okay, yeah. You you were indiscriminate with your toxins. (laughs) Yeah. Awesome. So, in terms of fossil record, yeah, there actually is some cool evidence of toxins, of chemical defenses in the record. Another area we could look that I didn't come across any uh, cool examples in my background research would be effects of toxins. Yeah. So, like, do we see bacterial infections that today are caused by toxins released by those bacteria? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or the uh, we, we talked about the amber of the fly pupae that had parasitic wasp larvae in them. Yes. All right. It might be reasonable to conclude <laughs> that if you got infected with an egg you may have been paralyzed by venom beforehand. Exactly. Like, uh, how many parasitoid wasps today don't use that as part of their step? Right. And so, yeah, there, there's lots of inferences that can be made, which is particularly interesting to me, because at the beginning of the episode, 
if you were just to ask me to guess how much fossil evidence we had for toxicity in, in past organisms, I would have assumed very little. Yep. But as you've made these points, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that does count. And I guess that does count too. And it's yeah. it's another reminder that's, yeah, toxins are pretty common. And when you pay attention to it from that point of view, then the evidence can also be fa- fairly common. Yeah, more than you'd expect. More than you'd expect. And speaking of which, let's move into our final big topic that I want to touch on. And that is toxin evolution yeah how do you become toxic the evolution of poisons and toxins and venoms this is a question that has been posited by many many researchers i looked at so many papers (laughs) there's so much research so in this section because this is such a broad topic what i'm going to do is focus on a few big questions and a few case studies yes examples of studies that have looked at these i'm not going to have like hard answers for these because we don't have hard answers seems reasonable let's start with one of the big questions which is what you just asked yeah how do you become poisonous become venomous and there is one group that you can't talk about venom evolution without discussing the vast majority of popular venom evolution research is done on snakes yes like i said there is a reason that i'm doing this episode (laughs) once again snakes are medically important and that's why there's so much more research on them than, say, you know, fish venoms yeah. or, or frog poisons. While, while a rock, you know, while a stonefish sting is really, really bad, it's not as common as a rattlesnake bite. <laughs> no. You need to know what rattlesnakes are doing if you're going to be a human. Yep. In terms of the origins of venom, there are two, there are a couple of big arguments with snakes. One of the big arguments is did venom in snakes show up? Once or multiple times. The single origin hypothesis is tightly tied with the phylogenetic group called Toxicophora. This is a group among squamates, lizards and snakes, that seems to include all the venomous lizards and snakes. Really? So it's your snakes, it's your beaded lizards and and Komodo dragons, but then it also has like iguanas and chameleons, I believe, are in there. There are members of this group that are not Uh, apparently venomous but the single origin hypothesis tends to suggest that venom showed up at the start of that group Hmm. and then was either inherited or lost by the different members which would put origins of snake venoms and other uh, squamate venoms at like 170 million years ago or or more wow others disagree there are some who have pointed to evidence that suggest that this group of venomous reptiles share similar genes and similar molecules that might have formed the basis of venoms, but that venom itself, they suggest, has shown up multiple times among snakes Mm -hmm. uh, and lizards. One of the things that is agreed upon, it seems, at least from what I've seen, is that there is a big expansion of snake venom diversity after the Cretaceous. So around 60 million years ago, you see this radiation of venom types uh, of different of venoms in modern groups of snakes. See, I'm just picturing out when they typically show radiations and like animations and it's just showing the animals spreading everywhere. Mm-hmm. And it's just like this massive like flood of venomous snakes. It's going snakes. Just, uh, and just everyone's like. <laughs> 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 so there's this disagreement with snakes and I use snakes as the example but these kinds of questions have been asked about basically all different yeah. groups of venomous organisms. And the answers are often different. According to references that I saw, it is thought, at least by one paper, that cephalopod venoms originated one time. Which makes sense if, if you know, they're very similar applications with very similar groups. Yeah. But as I mentioned with fish, venom is thought to have originated 19 different times in different fish because fish several different groups of mammals seem to have independently evolved venoms so the answer of when venom where venom starts seems to be different for different groups and poison in the in in the the context of like poisonous frogs and Mm -hmm. stuff seems to be even more confusing one recent one paper that i saw found that among amphibians, poison, uh, uh, secreted poison toxic substances, seem to have been gained and lost over and over and over again throughout their evolution. 
which is further complicated by the fact that they don't make all of those poisons. Yes. Some of those they are gaining from other organisms, which <laughs> makes it even harder to understand where it's all coming from. Well, it gets super weird when some of the members of your group are only situationally toxic. Yes. <laughs> so the question of where does venom and where does poison come from is really complicated. And then we can take a, a step even further which is what about toxins in the broadest sense, like immune toxins? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There is a 2016 study I found. I'll put all these studies, I'll link them in the, the, the blog post for people who want to read through them, uh, that looked at a group of proteins called defensins. I like uh, it. Which, as uh, it sounds like, are typically defensive, antimicrobial, things they, like they that. They don't take criticism well. The <laughs> they're very thin-skinned. <laughs> These are proteins that we see across eukaryotes. They're often part of the immune system, uh, the innate immune system, which is not like your immune system responds to a thing and attacks it. Yeah, it's not you're like it's not the the antibodies and white blood cells part. No, it's just the stuff that is there all the time to ward off infections. Oh. The 2016 study noted that we see uh, defensins all across eukaryotes. There are two origins that they found. One, a group that is that is shared by vertebrates and some invertebrates, and the other group is shared across invertebrates, plants, and fungi. <laughs> okay. Which suggests that that shared feature goes back billions of years. Yeah. That that is a eukaryote feature. Now, not all defensins are toxins. Oftentimes they're defensive, they're part of immune system responses or innate immune system. There are some that aren't. Some are involved in reproductive uh, oh. behaviors. Some are in involved in the immune system, but they're more about self-recognition than mm. uh, warding off other things. But then on the other hand, there are some that are very toxic. There are plants who have defensins that have adapted to be harmful to plants and other animals. Some animal venoms include defensin-derived toxins. Wow. So this is a group uh, of proteins that seems to go way back to the start of eukaryotes that has been repeatedly modified in all sorts of different ways for various toxin and sometimes not toxin purposes. And, and then, as you said in the beginning, the fact that Toxins are also common in bacteria. Yep. Says that the the answer to the question of when did toxins show up is probably very close to the question of when did life show up. Yeah, that, once again, to reiterate our point earlier on, chemical warfare, toxic warfare, aggression between organisms is more the default than not. That's so probably how we started being aggressive toward each other and then we got complicated with melee and and physical right. <laughs> things but yeah throwing your chemicals at each other is <laughs> is the default everything else is derived so then the next question becomes how do toxins evolve not just when and where but what is the actual process that brings you from into having venom, into having yeah. poisons and how such. do I go from having something that's kind of a toxin to being actively right. real bad? Once again, we will start with our main case study of snakes. <laughs> again. Always. <laughs> Another big argument in snake research is where venom genes come from. So the DNA, the gene sequences that actually code for venom. There are two main competing ideas here, two hypotheses that both agree that the venom proteins, right, the genes that code for toxic compounds in the venom of snakes, came from other genes in the body, right? They didn't pop out of nowhere. They didn't pick them up from bacteria or something. They had them in the body and they were... They are snake genes. Yes. The common one you'll often hear, this is a very popular hypothesis, is that they started out as genes in other parts of the body and then those genes would be copied, duplicated, and then those copies would end up getting expressed in a venom gland. Okay. So that you have a duplicate of some other gene that is changed in where it's expressed. This, is, for example, uh, there was a 2013 study of the genome of king cobras 
and they found evidence of uh, some compounds in the venom that seem to may have originated as pancreatic enzymes, oh. right? digestive enzymes. Yeah. The idea here is that snake venom is this com- cocktail of stuff that's been collected from all over the body from different things that have different functions that have been repurposed for venom. This is that scene from an action movie where the, the hero is pinned down in like their home or like a department store. And then they ramshackle together like bomb bombs and a flamethrower. Right. This is Iron Man three. Yes, where it's uh, common household materials in the right proportions. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then you fight graboids. But this has been challenged. Notably, there was a 2014 study that disputed this and argued that a lot of the venom genes we see, a lot of the genes coding for venom, are seen in lots of different parts of the body, including in the salivary glands of non-venomous snakes oh so their suggestion is that what we're seeing is that you have these genes that are already being expressed in lots of places and then copies of those end up being specialized for different functions in different places this their suggestion is basically that snake venom could should be thought of as highly specialized saliva yes this is stuff that was already salivary that became specialized for venom purposes. Killer spit. Which is a little less cool and exciting than the, I'm, I'm mixing pancreatic and digestive enzymes and all this stuff. Well, now it's just a really complicated way for them to drool into you and then kill right. you. This <laughs> is <just> really bad <laughs> spit. Ow. Ow. But the same questions have also shown variable answers in other venomous groups. So, uh, for example, I pointed out that in both of those snake examples there's some agreement among researchers that the venom genes, the genes that end up coding for toxins, come from copies of other genes, right? That that pancreatic, you had a gene that's coding for pancreatic enzymes, there's a duplication that happens, and then the copy ends up being modified. Mm-hmm. But research on some other groups have found that a lot of venom proteins aren't copies, they're just a gene that used to do something else has just totally changed. (laughs) Weird. And that that seems to be common, according to papers that I read in platypuses, wasps, and black widows, for example. Hmm. And then there was another study on robber fly venom that found lots of variation in where their venom genes seem to have been originating among their genome. Okay. So... As with the origins question, it seems like the answer to the question of how did you get your venom is different and variable across different groups. And there's all different genetic tricks that are being exploited to end up producing these toxic compounds. One thing that there seems to be agreement on, as far as I can tell, I always hesitate to say agreement. Mm -hmm. Because I'm going to say, well, they agree, and then someone out there is going to... I don't agree. I do not. (laughs) How dare you? (laughs) But there seems to be a repeated note that venom in snakes and a lot of other venomous animals are very rapidly evolving. Yeah, lots of selection pressure on it. Lots of strong selective pressure, which makes sense. Once you... Venom is super useful. It's easy to imagine that natural selection would highly favor specialization and differentiation of venoms. Which I think also makes sense because it lines up with the other features of animals like vipers, where it's like, not only is the venom how you protect yourself, you know, you you scare predators off either by threatening to bite them or biting them, and how you hunt, but your whole face has been restructured through your evolution to have hinging, sweeping fangs that are hollow like hypodermic needles and connected to large venom sacs that can pump the venom in and control the mounts. Like your lifestyle really centers around the fact that you're venomous. If you just suddenly delete the venom from a rattlesnake, it's not really a rattlesnake anymore. (laughs) It's going to have to figure something else out. Well, and we talked in uh, episode 88 about how teeth in mammals evolve very specialized forms Venom could easily be under very similar pressures because it's involved in food acquisition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If the specific structure of your venom 
is involved in food acquisition, yeah, there's going to be a lot of pressure on that. Especially, and I'll I'll mention this again here in a little bit, if your prey keeps evolving resistance to it. Yeah. But hold that thought. But I'm so excited. <laughs> Another uh, question that has been explored in a lot of venom studies is the question of, okay, we have a sense of when toxins show up. We have a sense of what genetic shifts are sort of leading to it. The other question that will come up is what actual changes are happening? How do you actually like physically change from something different types of toxins yeah, from mild to extra hot? Exactly. There was a 2014 study that compared defensins, so those immune related mm-hmm. proteins in insects to venom toxins in scorpions. Because it has been noted that certain insect defensins have a very similar structure to certain scorpion toxins. Specifically, they were comparing a defensin in wasps called navi defensin, which is antimicrobial, Listen. harmful to, to bacteria, with a type of neurotoxin in scorpions that messes with nerve activity in animals. And so they, they took these two and they, they are, these two are very similar, this defense and this toxin. And they did a little bit of gene tweaking and found that a single gene deletion, just the turning off of one gene that codes for this defense in, changes its structure such that it becomes effective as a neurotoxin. Whoa. And that when they did it, it looked like what used to be Navi defense in, for antimicrobial things changed into what they called navitoxin, <laughs> very cool, <laughs> lost some of its antibacterial function, but gained, at least it seems, the ability to interfere with animal neuro- neuronal processes, nerve processes. Wow. So this is a really fun example of how sometimes all it actually takes is a very small change. Yes. Just a little mutation and now it starts to make sense of why defensins have diversified into all sorts of different forms. I also saw a 1991 paper that listed a bunch of cases of fungal toxins. It examples where single mutations gave fungi toxins that were harmful to specific crop plants. Hmm. And then they became epidemics. Yes. Like a mutation changed the toxicity of this fungus that made it harmful to corn or something, and now all the corn is susceptible to this fungus. Wow. Another cool study I found that I want to mention about this sort of evolution of transitions was a study from 2019 that pointed out that a lot of fish have toxins in their mucus around the body that are there to ward off bacteria and things like that, and they hypothesized that venom glands in fish could have just formed from concentrating those toxins at the base of a spine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Much the same way that frogs, as we mentioned, have those spines like, I'm poisonous, but I can stab you with my poison. And once you're doing that, now you could be under selection for developing specialized venom glands and specialized venom structures. So there's all sorts of cool research into how you can go from using toxins, immune toxins, to venom toxins, from things that are poisonous to things that are venomous, from things that are, you know, possibly digestive function mm-hmm. to a venom, from stuff that was toxic to one thing and changed to be toxic to another. There's all sorts of neat ways, and not a lot of them are actually pretty simple and intuitive. Yeah, well, it's it's logical that even very simple toxic you know, traits or, or evolutionary steps would end up having huge effects. Because if if I'm an organism, if I'm a human, and... Let's imagine. Yep. It's a, in your mind's eye. If I'm a human that suddenly becomes poisonous to other humans, I win every fight I'm in now. <laughs> you sure do. Like, suddenly, the game completely shifts. Like those fungi. At, Suddenly, this whole group of organisms that didn't matter to my group, I am now deadly to. I can do whatever I want amongst that group. So, like, 
so, gaining toxicity even to a mild degree has huge side effects to how you interact with potentially a lot of the other things in your ecosystem. So yeah, as soon as you gain it, the gas is going to get pressed down on that feature <laughs> to then select for it, which is awesome. So the evolutionary history of toxins, poisons, toxins, venoms, is there is so much. There's so much. We could do a thousand more episodes on this topic. Lots of cool research asking lots of cool questions. Before we get off the subject, <laughs> one more thing I want to touch on is the question of evolutionary side effects of toxin evolution. Mm -hmm. Which I'm only going to mention briefly because these are different subjects, but they're fun to point out. Number one, toxin resistance. Yes. When you have organisms evolving toxicity, you will have other organisms evolving resistance. Like with toxin evolution, there's lots of convergence. Different creatures, different plants, different etc. evolving similar solutions. One example I want to point out, because it stuck out and I thought it was cool, and it's another case study. Several different groups of mammals have not only evolved resistance to snake venoms, but sometimes in very similar ways. Mm. So a, a paper I read pointed out that honey badgers, hedgehogs, and pigs have all developed resistance to certain snake venoms with the same mechanism of replacing an amino acid in the target protein. Oh. So amino acids are what build proteins in our bodies. Proteins are what build everything else in our bodies. <laughs> and sometimes there are multiple amino acids that will do the same function, right? Multiple blocks, right? Like Lego bricks, right? This is the same shape. It's just a different color or whatever. Yeah. It's different amino acid, different structure, but it'll do the same thing. And it's not vulnerable to this particular toxin. Yeah. Well, it's like if you, if you had something made out of a metal piece and you can make it out of steel if you make it out of aluminum depending on what it's doing it could do just as good a job but now it's not magnetic right exactly just like, like that and what i really liked about this example is not only have those three types of mammals used the same structural switch strategy to gain resistance it's also a strategy we see in cobras that make them resistant to their own venom <laughs> which is very cool Another evolutionary side effect of toxic toxin evolution is the evolution of seemingly way too lethal toxins. Yes. This is a question that has come up. It, I was mentioned in a number of papers that I read. Wh but why, though? Yeah, why are you unnecessarily, for the jobs you're doing day to day, this deadly? Right. A rattlesnake needs to kill a mouse, but it doesn't need to kill a human. Mm -mm. It just needs to hurt you to get you to go away. Well, a human is different, but it doesn't need to kill a, a, a wolf. Yes. Right? One painful bite, right? You shouldn't really need to be able to murder an elephant yes. with your cone snail toxin. Mm hmm And one of the suggestions for why this might happen is that toxin evolution is constantly going on with that toxin resistance evolution. Yeah, that we get caught in the middle of an arms race. If you have a species that has a target prey... That prey is going to be selected for resistance to the toxin. That venomous species is going to be selected for increasing, right? To keep up, to keep that toxin at a level so that it still affects the prey they're going after. Yeah, they or have a predator. Constantly keep just in front of that resistance. Right. Or it could be the other way. You know, it could be a predator that's eating something poisonous. And now the poison and the resistance yeah. are in this arms race. Well, now if you have this venomous animal that evolved its venom to take down a specific prey and that prey has been getting more and more resistant over x million years well if that venomous animal bites another animal yeah yeah this wasn't meant for you but now you're getting like the full concentrated version of it well it's like the the sci-fi scenarios where it's like these two empires have been at war for ten thousand years so yeah their militaries are all both insane so when you mess with them <laughs> Right. The the honey badger is mildly affected by that venom, that cobra venom, because it's been in that arms race. But then if you walk over and try to high five the cobra, yep. like, you're in trouble. Because it's offensive because they have no arms. Because that's exactly it. They're going to be real upset about it. Well, and I, I've heard other solutions for the, the hyper venomous with things like box jellies, 
where it's not a reaction to resistance, but they are delicate, light little animals. And when they catch a fish, if they don't kill it immediately, it'll tear them apart. And that if I, I remember right with them, it's basically accidental that they are just really effective against primates. Like sometimes it does seem to be an accident. Yeah. That uh, I, I saw this cited with certain mushrooms. Well, like, you know, that poison isn't for you, but some mechanism of that toxin happens to be extremely effective against us. Yeah, so it, it, it evolved to be fast acting against struggling fish and then turns out to also... Because like, how often is a box jellyfish naturally encountering primates? Very rarely. But it happens to work on us, so when it does, it just wrecks our day. Well, and like I pointed out earlier, venoms tend to not be a, a nearly as specific as some toxins. Yes. And that makes sense. If your venom is for prey, you don't want a venom that's just effective against one type of prey. Especially typically. when you're a, a jelly that is basically just floating there. Right, exactly. <laughs> one other thing that I, I'm going to say it, and then we're going to move on because it's a whole other episode topic. <laughs> we mentioned it earlier. Aposematism. The evolution of warning colors yes. goes hand in hand with poison, especially poison, and venom evolution. And then so does mimicry Yay. of warning. That, like the evolution of venom and poisons and animals especially is just full of these examples of animals developing warnings, mm -hmm. colors, but then also like rattlesnake rattles and stuff. And then other animals hijacking those colors to seem dangerous there's this whole like side evolutionary topic spawned off the side of this question of poison evolution which is so very cool well and it's so strongly connected that things like the flamboyant cuttlefish which is brightly colored and mm -hmm. doesn't camouflage as often as you'd expect a cuttlefish to was all has always been described as because it's toxic it's one of the only toxic you know like not venomous but its tissues are toxic uh, one of the only cephalopods to have that. But then I went to try to look it up and I couldn't find any research confirmation on that. And in fact, found people who said, well, it hasn't actually been found to certainly be toxic. People have just been kind of assuming it was. Which is exactly what it wants you yes. to think. <laughs> <laughs> so that, listen, send in your request if you want an episode <laughs> yep. about warning coloration. Now, we've talked a whole bunch. Like I said, this is a breeze by of this these questions of poison toxin venom evolution now you understand why the name of the episode is a poor name yes venom and poison well okay venom is made of poisons <laughs> it is kind of a type of poison also it's more accurately toxins because they're bio whatever hopefully this has been fun for everybody as much as it has been for me i loved researching this i've got a bunch of papers set aside that i didn't get to read that i'm gonna go read because i'm excited about it before we wrap up, we have... So normally we would say, all right, end of the topic and now a patron question. But not this time. Oh. This time we have two patron questions that are both related to the topic of venom and poison. Our cup floweth over. So we're going to go ahead and answer these two uh, as part of this big discussion. Yeah. Give me that first one, Will. Our first patron question is from Zabby, who asks... Were there any venomous dinosaurs? I find it hard to believe that we haven't discovered any venomous dinosaurs yet. Synornithosaurus was the best candidate, but it has been it has since been ruled out to have had venom. Right. Like I mentioned earlier, Synornithosaurus was the, the go-to example, but that's disputed. It, it, yeah. It's the one that always comes up. Outside of that, no. Yeah. There don't appear to be any good examples of dinosaur venom evidence either in the fossil record or today. Yes, one of the groups you may have noticed we just continued not to mention were birds. Yes, there are poisonous birds. Yes. There are birds that sequester poisons from plants and, and other sources, but there don't appear to be any really venomous birds. Yeah, actively venomous. So I agree with Zabby mm -hmm. that I would also be surprised if there were no venomous dinosaurs. Although, there also aren't venomous crocs. Nope. Once again, maybe it's another weird archosaur thing. Well, that's what I was going to say is, for how big the group of dinosauria is, 
it seems with that much diversity, surely one of you developed fangs or ankle spurs. Right, right. You know, something to administer venom. But then also, we are just now maybe confirming the first aquatic (laughs) (laughs) dinosaur. So dinosaurs have some weird trends. Yeah. So, like, uh, though it seems like they should, maybe they didn't. I I will say... There were definitely toxic dinosaurs. They had immune systems. Yes. Uh, It would surprise me immensely if there were never any poisonous dinosaurs. Yeah, like surely one of you learned how to eat a toxic plant or or something. frogs or something. Yeah. So, it, but that's difficult to tell from the fossil record. So we may someday find evidence of venom in dinosaurs, or it may just be a thing that one of those things that this group just never quite did. Yeah. We have another patron question. We do. This one is from Dylan, who asks, Do we know anything about toxicity in Timnospondyles, early amphibians? Do we know when it developed in modern salamanders? So, the the question of amphibian uh, uh, poisons, as I mentioned before, there was a study that I read that showed lots of gains and losses over the course of amphibians that we have today. I haven't seen any references to pinpointing where it seems to have originated Mm -hmm. uh, in salamanders or frogs. It's something that's ubiquitous among amphibians today, but the evolution looks like, from what I saw, there it may just be this very complicated history of gaining and losing poisons. I've never seen anything to indicate early amphibians uh temnus bundles and such you know paleozoic amphibians were poisonous i've never heard that mentioned or even really suggested by like research dealing with them no. and as we discussed in the fossil section i don't know that you'd have an easy time telling that yeah uh, it's not impossible there's definitely ways you could end up stumbling across evidence of it and so that's another one of those where once again i would be Super surprised if none of them were ever poisonous. Yes. Lots of fish are poisonous. Lots of fish are venomous. Most amphibians today are poisonous. Surely there were some early tetrapods that produced toxins or sequestered toxins. There could even have been venomous ones. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, as far as I know, we don't have any evidence of it. Yeah, well, what we really need is a technique similar to the, the laser identifications of soft tissues yeah, i was kind just of thinking thing. that for for the chemicals that you see in toxins if we could identify toxic you know toxin traces in skin remains that's what we need but i don't know remotely what that science would be i wonder how different they would be from like i wonder if you could tell the difference between an enzyme that interferes with nerve cells <laughs> in your body Versus one that interfered with nerve cells in somebody else's. Yeah. Excellent questions. Fun questions to which the answer is, I don't know. Yeah. I, maybe someday we'll know. Uh, once again, I'd be surprised if we didn't get some answers to those questions. I, I can say to both those questions, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, same. I really would love us to discover a, a toxic timnospondyle or a venomous dinosaur. That would be awesome. Yeah, well, I, I am on record over and over again saying that i am in favor of imagining dinosaurs as brightly colored let's throw some poison in there yeah make those colors mean something (laughs) big thanks to everybody who requested this topic i've had so much fun big thanks to both of our patrons for asking their questions to all of our other patrons for supporting us to all of our other listeners for tuning in as always especially with a topic like this there's a good chance we touched on a thing and you went, boy, I wish you would talk about that for an hour. Yeah, so did what we send it to us in a request. We are always open for requests for future episodes. Every episode comes with a blog post. So if you check out our blog link in the description of this uh, podcast episode, there will be a post with bonus links, uh, some pictures of poisonous and venomous organisms, uh, places where you can explore more and learn more yourself maybe get as excited as i did about some of these cool papers <laughs> keep your ears out spooky's coming out this month spooky episode 100's coming out in november and then th- there's yet more to come yeah we're not stopping we will be continuing into the triple digits <laughs> just you watch us do it 
And with that, let's wrap up. Yeah. Thanks Good. for listening. Good episode. I had fun. Hopefully everyone else had fun. If they did or didn't, I'm sure they'll let us know. <laughs> Please do. Contact us in all the ways we list in the outro music. And we'll see you next time. In a couple of weeks. Oh, that's right. Every fortnight. We release episodes every fortnight. Join us next time. Bye, everybody. (laughs) Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.